This is the Bitcoin Made Simple Podcast. Here's your host, Corey Tusick. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. On this week's episode, I interviewed Jack Pasovic. Jack is a the senior editor at Human Events, um, and he's a former Navy Intel officer, China analyst, um, and he... Um, He's on the right side, on the right wing side of, um, you know, he's a conservative uh, pundit that uh, has, you know, worked at OAN and uh, a couple other uh, networks along the way. So, um, you know, I wanted to get him on because he's tweeted before about uh, Bitcoin. And then um, we actually picked up a documentary of his that that he did uh, for free and we put we're putting it on our platform. Um, so I wanted to talk to him because he has this, you know, unique background in understanding, you know, China, what their focuses are and stuff like that. So we get into all that, um, you know, kind of picking his brain on where the, the big geopolitical, uh, you know, how this is all going to fall out, uh, you know, with the Bitcoin taking over and, you know, the becoming the standard, how that will affect everything and how people want to control the money. So, oh yeah, we, we talk about all that kind of stuff, um, if you are triggered by me having somebody that is a conservative, then I am sorry that you feel that way. Um, but there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, and if you really are really upset about it, then just send me somebody on the left that is the, I said this in the podcast, send me the opposite of Jack Posobiec. I'll interview that person because if you know anything about me at this point, I am for free speech. I'm for everyone having a voice. Uh, that's what my streaming platform is all about. And uh, that's why uh, I'm interviewing him and uh, we'll interview anybody and talk about Bitcoin and where they see it's going to affect the world and how they, they see it playing out here. So uh, today, the show sponsor is Coinbeast Connect. Do you have questions about Bitcoin? Personalize your learning and book a one-on-one -on -one video call with a Bitcoin pro on Coinbeast Connect. Learn about mining, security, the Lightning Network, DeFi, taxes, and many other topics. It's really easy. Choose your topic and pro, select a date when you're available, and bring your questions to the meeting room. Book your first call today by going to coinbeast.com and clicking on the Connect tab. Be prepared for the financial revolution and get the knowledge you need. And also, uh, the show is brought to you by, it's sponsored by Movies Plus. Why is it sponsored by Movies Plus? Uh, because it's a streaming platform that I own. Um, so that's why it's sponsored by Movies Plus. Uh, go to mymoviesplus.com, or if you go into the app store on your phone, on your streaming device, wherever it may be, and search Movies Plus, the app will come up. It's uh, streaming freedom for everyone. That is our motto. We are um, a place to give everyone a voice and not uh, you know, take anybody's voice away from them. So check it out there. And if you search, if you want to sign up with the promo code, uh, you can use Jack's that he he's gonna um has a promo code that's poso p-o-s-o but if you want to get uh, a discount on your uh, membership uh, when you sign up use promo code btc and uh, you'll get a nice discount and i hope you guys enjoy the content we're gonna have a lot of bitcoin content going up there um, a little bit to start but i'm developing some stuff and i think you guys really enjoy it so uh, if you want to follow the show it's at bitcoin simply on Twitter, my personal one is at Tusik Corey, and my the show email is Bitcoin Made Simple Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks. Sorry, I've been all over the place because today is corporate uh, tax deadline day <laughs> for extensions. So I've been uh, all over the place trying to do that. And I that's why it threw me off whenever you were calling. I thought you were my accountant calling me at first. I got like, oh, crap. Oh. What does he want now? <laughs> so yeah it's uh it's a blast but uh how you been good good you're uh so you're at human events now right um what's uh you know i want to explain for people that uh that maybe don't know you um you know what you do and and what your background is and where and where you're at now yeah sure so uh, my background is as a fire navy intelligence officer uh focused on predominantly China, but also spent a year at Guantanamo Bay doing a deployment there on counterterrorism. So got to be um, working in the interrogation cell there. And so got to be quite familiar with the, uh, the Taliban and uh, uh, various members of Al Qaeda 1.0 before they, that, uh, that sort of problem set morphed into ISIS, ISIS and others. But of course, now the Taliban are back in full force. So 
it's uh it's nice to see my my former friends going on to uh to uh be promoted in greater glories and achieve higher <laughs> things and that's what life is about right it's about achievement it's about overcoming obstacles and about seeing um, those that you know uh go go uh better you know improve themselves it's it's really yeah it's a wonderful thing and uh so then um did OAN for three years. I was the political correspondent in DC, but really just all over the country, you know, all over the world, even we uh, sent to Europe a couple of times for them. And then um, now just started back up as senior editor for human events. What we're doing is we're actually kind of bringing back the human events brand, but in a, um, you know, in kind of a more of a digital format for, for the 21st century. This was Ronald Reagan's favorite magazine back in the day. It's known for having a sort of very, you know, kind of, old school conservative you know not neocon um more of like a like almost a paleo conservative kind of take on things very populist very grassroots in a sense and um bringing that up so we just launched the website back up and it's now publishing news on a regular basis we've got scoops exclusive reporting up there that i'm driving and then also this week we just launched in conjunction with um the turning point usa live network I uh, just launched a brand new podcast on there, which, you know, it's been incredible. We're now ranked number four on our first week. We're number four in terms of all news and top 20 for all podcasts nationwide. Wow. And what's the name of that? A human events daily. The human events. That's crazy. That's awesome. Um, so I assume you've been getting massive downloads <laughs> within one week if it shoots you up that high. Yeah, well, it's, you know, the algorithm is based on downloads and then also so new subscribers and, um, you know, timeliness. So it's not just about uh, charting when you first come out. Though of course, we, you know, we absolutely very uh, thankful and grateful for all the support. But, you know, we're just going to just got to keep it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you had a focus on China um, and that is of particular interest to the Bitcoin world. Um, because you know they hate Bitcoin and and banned it. Um, so what what was your focus on China whenever you were in the military? Uh, so particularly, we'd be focused on Chinese military designs for uh, for East Asia. So looking, of course, uh, Taiwan is is the the number one flashpoint. But then also what they're doing vis a vis Japan, South Korea, their neighbors in India, and so all of the kind of border conflicts that are going on in um in the hindu kush still go on to a regular basis so and that as well as their um one of the big ones of course was the the south china sea conflagration that was taking place when i when i was still serving and you know <laughs> we would we would watch china building these islands and we would start arming them they'd start militarizing them and you know we kept saying that you know it doesn't seem like we're going to get into a hot war with china anytime soon so i don't think that they're going to listen to us any time that we make some diplomatic statement because they just don't care particularly very much about the, um, you know, these, these uh, international organizations like the UN or ASEAN that we're constantly trying to back up. And at the end of the day, we always sort of understood that it wasn't going to, if, you know, we're not going to go to kinetic war with China and they're not mm -hmm. going to play by the same rules that we do in terms of this, you know, the, the Tony Lincoln has a line, the international rules-based order, right? Um, and so the question was then why doesn't the U.S. use economic leverage on China? Because obviously that is the greatest part of our leverage. Now, of course, because there's such a symbiotic relationship between the U.S. and China now, so China is the manufacturer, the U.S. is the consumer, but many of the companies are structured, the multinationals are structured in such a way where the, the capital is flowing from the U.S. into China, the wealth stays in China, but... Uh, a lot of the profits are shared back with the, you know, the owners in the U.S. And so it benefits, of course, uh, the middlemen throughout China, it benefits the, the workers to an extent. But it's, you know, for the U.S., it's, it's just that, uh, that those owners, those financiers, that class. And so really, we looked at it from a perspective of the only thing that's ever going to drive a wedge here is economic leverage. But you're going to upset people at various nodes within that supply chain and within that, uh, you know, within that network that I just described. And that's exactly what you saw happen throughout 
the Trump administration, whenever the tariffs or other economic sanctions we talked about with China, it was always who? It was, it was Wall Street. It was New York. It was investors. You know, these were the group, private equity firms. These were the groups that were very upset about all these things. Why? Because it hurt their business models. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it hurt their bottom line. So they they weren't a, a fan. And I mean, you know, uh, uh, I say all the time I'm I'm anti-political affiliation. I don't, you know like support any like i can't look at a politician right now where i'm like yeah i support you um but uh the you know it, i don't think it was a coincidence that whenever it looked like trump was going to win on election night all of a sudden the chinese markets were tanking and and then uh and then miraculously everything rebounded um so uh you know it leads you to yeah, so as they say funny how that works yeah it's uh it's interesting um and i'm curious you know so with bitcoin and and i'll tie them the two together because there is an angle here with with uh what we're talking about but um before i do that i want to get like your just general understanding of bitcoin and like when you first heard about it and uh and where you are on like on your bitcoin journey i guess Okay, well, you know, Bitcoin is part of my portfolio. You know, that's something that I purchased. Uh, I would prob- probably say I first heard about it probably like 2015, 2016. Uh, bought in when things were pretty low in 2018. So, you know, my my Bitcoin stash is looking pretty good right now. But it's never really been something that I've tracked on a day to day basis. And you know, of course, seeing you know all the crazy Elon Musk headlines when he sort of plays around with seeing what he can do with his. Um, you know, his substantial fan base and use that to sort of fluctuate the price of it up and down. But, you know, really also looking at it from a perspective of will crypto be a alternative to fiat currency? And if so, it doesn't surprise me that China was kind of flirting with it for a little bit mm-hmm. because China, of course, wants to knock the US dollar, the petrodollar off being the world reserve currency. Um, However, I think they're reticent to put sort of their own currency up as as the replacement because I think they I think they know um, that that will sort of be a huge shock to the system and probably spark a huge response from the US. So I think that China has been moving and sort of hoping that people will move to a basket of currencies. You know, that's sort of the new the new Mm -hmm. lingo you always hear from that. And so uh, it seemed for a while that they were interested in using Bitcoin. But now it's I for whatever reason, I think probably because they realized that they literally have no control over it whatsoever yep. that, uh, you know, that, that they decided to cut loose. Yeah, that's the beauty of it is that they, you know, um, were flirting with it. And that's what like, you know, every other every other cryptocurrency other than Bitcoin is centralized and you know, no matter what they say, they might say, oh, it's decentralized, but it's it's really like Ethereum runs predominantly on Amazon Web Services, you know, and stuff like that, where like somebody asked me, like, how do you shut down Bitcoin? And I was like, I, you would have to shut off all the electronics in the world simultaneously. Right, you'd have to, right. You'd have, but even if you did that, you'd have to find one person, you know, one person could have a wallet somewhere and yep. it's back up. Yeah, yeah, you could spin up a, you know, repair some nodes or something like that. And what, what, do like a technical the, um, what do they call it? There's a, a cold storage, I think, yep. is one, you know, where, yeah. where you've got something that's just not connected to anything. It's not even plugged in. It's not even charged, but it's got it there. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's fascinating to me watching, um, like, I uh, my audience is probably sick of me saying this, but it is my, uh, I said, a, a small theory, 1% chance that Satoshi is from the future, because you know, if you look at like how monetary policy was unraveling and, you know, imagine like the year 2140 and there's this group of people that are like, if we only had a sound, solid money cap, you know, that was decentralized and not controlled by anybody that any one person, then, you know, we, we could have avoided this disaster. And then they picked 2008 because that's when the financial crisis happened. And they're like, oh, you know what? That's 12 years before COVID and all that kind of stuff. So this will this will really work. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, like I think Ray Dalio I saw today said something like, you know, oh, the governments can shut it down. And it's like, you obviously have not even looked at this for more than five minutes like it's impossible they can't shut it yeah, down. yeah i mean the government i mean put it this way like you know they can they can throw a tax at it they they can make it very hard for you to use bitcoin and and certainly mm-hmm. if they you know if they really want to you know no encryption of the world is going to stop the government from looking over your shoulder if they decide 
to literally open up a warrant, go onto your phone and then have, you know, basic root. If they're, if they're surveilling the equipment, right. They can see whatever's on your screen, right. So you're going to the screen, they can see all that. Um, that of course is not something that they're going to be doing on a, on a regular basis at, at a mass scale, right. It mm-hmm. just you can't, but, um, so the idea that it's, it's always going to be completely that any transaction, um, that's digital is going to be completely secure is, you know, not now that that being said, you know, there's like, we, we just talked about the different types of, you know, using storage, using phones that aren't connected, et cetera. Like that, I mean, there certainly are ways to anonymize yourself. Um, yeah. There's a guy but, that I'm working with that's going to do, it's called Seed Signer and it's air gapped. So it's not like uh-huh. anonymizing it, but it it doesn't allow like whatever your wallet is, is never touched the internet. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. There, there's good, there's so many ways you can think of to to separate it out, right? And to make it safer. Um, but I guess to put it this way, right? If they If they really wanted to shut it down, they could make it very, very, very hard. That being said, um, or especially like when you're converting it back in, you know, into fiat and then out of fiat. But that being said, as more and more people and more and more enterprises start to accept crypto and start to become more willing to use it, um, you know, I think I think at the at the broadest sense, you could really just say that it's gone from something that was at one point a speculative asset is now an asset in reality. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not sure how close you've been uh, tracking El Salvador and how they made it legal tender. Um, but uh, the the funny thing is, I think I think it's the IMF has to has to own Bitcoin because they have to own a they have to own a portion of every country's uh, recognized legal tender. Oh, that's um, funny. And so it's just really ironic. You're like, oh, that's hilarious. Um, You know, and and I think that more countries like El Salvador are going to start going, wait a minute, because the one guy, uh, Jack Mallers, um, who runs uh, the Strike uh, Lightning uh, Company, they he said um, he was setting up their payment systems down there. And and one of his the things he said was that there's no stimulus checks coming down here. They run on the U.S. dollar. All these people are dependent on the U.S. dollar. That was their currency. And they depend on remittances, but no stimulus checks that, you know, were devaluing their dollar. None of them were coming to El Salvador. And so you start to think like, what other countries out there are going, wait a minute, like, you know, they're seeing these, these top powers basically run away with the, the monetary debasement train. You know, don't I mean, do you think that other small countries are going to start going, uh, let's uh, let's switch over to a Bitcoin standard? And, and yeah, that's a great point. Like, and, and Latin America, because they do have a you know, substantial amount, um, even you know, Mexico to an extent, but also those Central American countries, really, that they do. You're right. They have a ton of remittances. And so the being to, as as sensitive to U.S. dollar fluctuations, you know, that is going to be something where they can see a direct hit of hey, convert this money over right now or else, you know, uh, you know, it's going to be worth uh, a lot less the next, next week than it is, that it, you know, you're in like a Weimar Republic situation with that. Mm-hmm. So, so I could say, that, you know, Estonia, I would put, I would not necessarily because of remittances, just because, but just because that they seem to be, they seem to be on the cutting edge of kind of jumping on whatever, you know, they do that whole e-citizen thing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think they're more open to, sort of the virtual world as it were than than other countries and so you know it wouldn't surprise me if estonia was another one that was out there uh, early on this yeah and it's interesting so the on twitter spaces i've talked with a few times uh lord fusatua who's a uh, in the parliament of tonga um and he is talking about it and he's got laser eyes you know to get it to 100k bitcoin to 100k and and he um but he's talking about harnessing wave energy in order to mine Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, for emerging markets like that, it's, it's huge for them. And so, um, but also interestingly, and I'm sure you know this with China, but um, I mean, he said, and I can't believe if I were him, I would be hiding and not saying these things. I'd be like, nope, I don't, I'm not spilling these beans. But he, um, he said, he was like, I've been in Beijing in meetings with the highest levels of the CCP. He's like, and they've unequivocally said that the 1800s were Great Britain's, the 1900s were the United States, and the 2000s are ours, and they're going to be the world dominant power. Oh yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that's uh, when I lived in China. Uh, so I lived in China for two years, even before I joined the military. Um, I, I worked for the American Chamber of Commerce, and then worked for a U.S. firm out of Shanghai. That um, yeah, you they would say stuff like that all the time, hundred percent. 
Yeah. So there's like no doubt in the, in your mind that they, that's what their, their goal is, is to basically, I think begrudgingly, I mean, at this point, the U S dollar is, is worthless to them. They, they stopped buying U S bonds, I think. Right. I'm pretty well, sure. I, they, the, the, the line I always he, use for that one is that um, I actually had a Chinese guy say to me once and didn't, didn't even say this as a, they don't view it as an insult, right? They don't view it as I'm not putting you down. It's just for them. It really, they, like you said, laser focused on seeing China become the preeminent world power. That's all they care about. Right. And they don't and care if it takes they, generations. No, no, no. And they don't, it's not that they hate the United States. It's that they want to be where the United States is. That's the difference. And they actually said, uh, a guy said to me, um, I want to be in a position where Chinese families are adopting American children who are in need. Hmm. Wow. That's interesting. Um, Cause that's, and that's just how to they have, look at it. That, yeah. That's exactly just how they look at it. And interesting because they're only allowed to have two kids. So that'd be, <laughs> um, that's weird. Yeah, they're teasing with that's around crazy. with that a little bit. So, so if you're a member of one of the, um, there's like 50 plus different minority, I think 50, 56 plus, uh, minority groups in China that, so if you're, if you're one of them, now you can have, I think you, you've always been, you know, sort of exempt from the one child policy. And I think they're now starting to uh, tease it up to three because they realize that they are going to run into a, an artificial population cliff because um, once the seniors um, start to start to pass on, then as they sort of uh, their Gen Xers, go up the gen xers are their first really sort of the tail end of gen x will be their first one child generation and then it's really the elder millennials that are solidly the one child generation and so you're going to have a position then where you're going to have all of these um you know all of these retirees and then hardly anybody in the working class just in or i should say the working pool of workers you're going to have an almost inverted pyramid kind of situation in terms of population yeah yeah and, you know, there's a interesting, you know, what you're talking about kinetic war earlier. And um, I maybe eventually down the road that you would probably enjoy listening to this guy or, or maybe it'd be good, a good conversation to have. Um, but there's this uh, this NIM, you know, this, this pseudonym out there that uh, he goes by laser hodl and he's been he used to be in Silicon Valley. That's basically all you know about him. Um, and he's been positing this theory that. Um, what we're living through right now is is a monetary reset, you know, where they the you know, let's say the the 15 families or whatever that that control the the wealth of the world um, have always been able to reset monetary policy with war and, um, you know, things like World War Two and all that kind of stuff. Now, with the proliferation of nuclear arms, he's saying that you know, really at this point you can't go to kinetic war because it's mutually assured destruction. So he views what's happening with COVID as their way to shove through the monetary reset. Um, and we see these things with like the, the world economic forum saying, you know, you, the year's 2030 and you'll own nothing and you'll be happy and insane statements like that. So what are your thoughts on that and where China fits into that and, and kind of like the geopolitical thing that's going on right now that i i can't believe at the beginning of COVID i never would have thought but i'm like you know what this is all tied to kind of bitcoin like i think you know there is there would be a monetary re reset happening anyways but they have to kind of ramp it up because they're losing their control of the money printer so what are your thoughts on on that kind of theory well i do think that um you know that that i, I can totally see where he's coming from on his analysis um and uh, I think he's right that mutual assured destruction is something that actually does freak out a lot of people. Um, that being said, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that COVID was something that uh, anybody had planned for, but I think it's something that various governments and various entities realized that once, once it was out there in the world, that, you know, they could use this to serve various purposes. Um, and so you're seeing with the Great Reset now, is this idea that as, as I was just talking about before about that sort of way the world is set up, you know, that was kind of the handshake in the early, late, late nineties, early two thousands going from NAFTA and then into the introduction of China into the world trade organization, that manufacturing would be done in Asia, right? So the workers of Asia would be exploited because, you know, the American workers, there's too many, too many middle-class, too many laws, they can't be exploited anymore. So, 
you know, there's, there's, there's too much going there. So we're going to shift that over and then shift all the secondary and tertiary wealth creation into Asia. So the financial, so the capital financial markets will flow there. They won't flow into the U S they won't be building up the U S the U S is going to see, yeah, they'll see growth, but, uh, but it won't be actually touching anyone who is, who isn't within that, you know, that, that parity within that level. And so then when something like COVID comes around, it just accelerates it, right? So then they can say, well, look, now it makes sense for us to, for example, when you look at like BlackRock, Blackstone, buy up all the houses. And then we are going to be, you know, we won't have a housing crisis anymore because we'll control all the houses. You won't have these some private issues anymore. China, of course, is actually going through that right now where Evergrande, this, which is China's largest real, I mean, uh, real estate developer, it, it's talking about, they're talking about if you go to Zero Hedge or other financial analysts, people hit me up all the time saying, this could be a Lehman Brothers moment for China, realizing wow. that because they've been doing the exact same thing the US was doing. They say, if we just, you, if we continue to expand using housing policy, as a way to expand our GDP, as a way to push construction, as a way to say that we're spending, 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 look at how much we're building, look at how much we're, we're doing. But you have these skyscrapers like in, in the city of Kunming, um, which is close to where the bat caves are actually, um, there were 15 <laughs> skyscrapers actually just had to be demolished because they sat on the market for seven years. And nobody had, had had moved in. Nobody had bought them. You know, they weren't like completely, you know, finished. They wanted to do something else with the land, so they demolished fifteen skyscrapers that nobody had ever bought. They call them ghost cities in China. That's and crazy. so we are going through a an, an absolute period. I am somebody who believes in the fourth turning. This idea that you know uh, cycles of history and cyclical time. So we are going through a period where what was once strong is now weak and what was once weak is now becoming strong. Right. And so you're, mm -hmm. you, you see this, va these various changes and the way, the way that you kind of just said, there are resets that seem to go on, but the rich seem to say who they are. Um, those power levels don't ever seem to change. It's just somebody else is kind of wearing the crown. Yeah. Um, so w where do you see the power shifting here? I mean, is it clearly, is China going to win at this point and, and be the world power? Well, I don't think it's inevitable, right? You know, because you've also seen times in history, like, I mean, look at World War I and II, where, um, you know, there's certainly from an economic perspective, uh, people who view those as times where Germany was trying to become the preeminent power and they, they were stopped, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, you know, obviously there's, there's kind of oversimplifying it right there but there are times where you get put into these what's called the, the thucydides trap and uh it doesn't always mean that you're going for a reset sometimes the the great power stays the great power um and so really what i what i try to explain to people is that all of this has been done by design this is all done by policy this is all done by handshakes at the highest levels they know exactly what they're doing and and to your point it's, it's not the politicians on TV that are the ones that are making these decisions or even having these conversations. Yeah. This is way above their heads, right? Those are the guys that are just propped up to kind of give you the semblance of a political system. And we always wonder, well, like, well, how, how come they're not really getting anything done? How come policy never seems to change, you know, from administration to administration? And it's because well, it's, it's, they don't want it to anymore, right? They want you arguing about, you know, what what dress AOC wore to the Met Gala as if, you know, it's, it's distraction. It's all bread and circuses so that all of these higher issues are going on behind the scenes and nobody's paying attention to it. Yeah. I mean, that's my fear with, you know, them shoving stuff down everyone's throats right now. Um, and I, I kind of, you know, liken it to like somebody flailing because they're losing control at this point, because I think this was supposed to be a little bit more structured and, the, and this type of reset and shift of power is supposed to happen over a longer period of time. But they, their, their key was always controlling the money printer. That was their, that was their weapon. They could control the, the wealth. And, and something like Bitcoin came along. And now they're like, you know, could you imagine being like the you know, generation, like current generation that's supposed to be like helming the ship of this you know, life, like you know, dynasty power? 
and it's it's going to fall apart in your lap? Somebody, like, I'll put it this way. I'll, um, somebody pretty high level said this to a Silicon Valley guy said this to me once that and it's a really good um, phrase. So I like to use it. It's almost like the people that are running the institutions now. It's like it, with each generation of the dynasty, as it passes on, you know, they turn over the keys, people get older, people, you know, pa- die, they pass on. But there's always supposed to be like a memo that the older generation left kind of like explaining to people, hey, this is what you do here. Use this policy. This is what, how you deal with China. This is how you deal with these type of markets and just, you know, continue on like this and you'll be fine. But it almost seems like the current uh the current leaders of these things is like they've lost the memo somewhere along, along yeah. the way so they're they're running these institutions and they know what they're they kind of have an idea about what they're supposed to be doing and yet they can't quite seem to figure it out they, they you know they constantly make the wrong decision because they're they're missing the sort of you know um operating manual that was supposed to be given to them along with the whole thing yeah what are your thoughts on how blatantly they're just saying stuff now like where they're just like, you know, this well, so, is an opportunity. So prior to, you know, prior to social media, this is why they wanted to strike down social media. You were talking about mutually assured destruction. And you're saying that nuclear, and we had this idea that nuclear weapons are the most powerful weapon in the world, but they're not. Actually, mm-hmm. the most powerful weapon in the world right now is social media. And because it has the ability to change perceptions without even holding, right, kinetic war. So that's information war is above kinetic war in a sense. And so that's where you get fourth generation, fifth generation warfare, um, where fifth generation warfare is, is the application of kinetics into uh, information war. So you look at the 2020 riots are a good example of that. Yeah. And so um, you have a situation now where because of social media, people can be fact check in real time. You can pull up what Dr. Fauci said two years ago. That was the complete opposite of what he said today. And at the same time, it's all about and this is what Bitcoin totally understands it it's not just about the content it's about your system of distribution if Mm -hmm. you have distribution at scale they can't stop you and that's sort of the point so they've lost the ability to control distribution supply chain at scale in terms of the information supply chain social media has completely disrupted this and because of that they are just They've lost a complete grip on the ability to persuade by statement, to persuade by propaganda, to control uh, by these various means of, of just, just information dominance it's because they've lost information dominance. Now there's information competition. And so what do they do? Well, the only thing left to the, to the system is, is naked authoritarianism, right? You have a president of the United States who gets up and says, you know, we will mandate this. And if you don't get it, you know, you will be excised from polite society. You won't be able to hop in a car. You won't be able to get a job. You won't be able to buy groceries, et cetera, et cetera, because they don't really have the ability to persuade or even, you know, put out these sort of more, uh, you know, more, more euphemistic information dalliances the way they did in the past yeah and you know you and i i think are are similar in age but um you know i've been trying to explain to people like you have to realize how easy it was for information for them to sway public opinion in the past because you know everybody you know know, michael malice actually had a really good point on this to to explain mm -hmm. to people um he said he said take a look at Stephen Colbert, Jimmy Kimmel, and Jimmy Fallon, right? So mm-hmm. those are the three, the three choices you get for your evening news. And yet they're all kind of the same person, right? They all kind of yep. say the same thing. They have the same opinions. That's what the news was like back in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, I mean, you know, I think about growing up and in like a very simplified version of it is like, you know, we got like my parents came home from work. You know, we ate dinner, we sat down and put on channel two, four or 11, you know, like CBS, ABC or NBC, watch the nightly news. And everybody yeah, in, sat in Philly, there. it was it was three, six and ten. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody sat there and was like, OK, that is what they told me happened. That's what I will do. Like, this is how I feel. And then we, you know, we just knowingly like we um, unknowingly just were fed information. We're like, well, this is the reality. So let's do that. And then. Well, but remember also, because economics 
the economic situation was better for the country uh, yeah. in in them thar days um <laughs> them thar that days. <laughs> it, it world offense just didn't seem to affect the average person that much right because you mm. you didn't need to worry about it right the, uh times were better um you you could go out and get a job and this is one thing where i always kind of laugh at sort of the the uh you know the sort of uh generational rivalries that go on between the boomers and the millennials and the zoomers etc and you know there's this there was that whole thing about in the baby boomer and even in the gen x generation to an extent of you know just download you know pronounce your rose your rosary your uh put off your resume and uh go down to the local store and find the manager and give him a firm handshake and tell him you want a job <laughs> and like that go do that for 30 years like you used to actually be able to get a job like that because the economy was literally that good right yeah. that that world doesn't exist anymore um my my mom just retired right 40 years and she was able to work 40 years for one company she didn't even have a bachelor's when she started she was working on her associates signs up the company paid for her uh, to finish school, they pay for her to get a master's, all of her education, all the benefits, 40 years on, right? Those type of jobs don't exist anymore. Or if they do, they're not as, you know, as open as they used to be. And so I think for a lot of people that are around now, they don't realize that, that you know, that's what they say, the past is a foreign country, but so much has changed so quickly. And a lot of it really is economic driven. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, Trump was, you know, famous for bringing up the fake news, um, you know, like, uh, you know, information, you know, you don't know what you're going to see out there. But I kind of think, you know, what you were saying about the 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 monopoly on information. Do you I mean, if there was a way that they could go back in time and governments could stop the Internet and and everything it became, do you think they would? Oh, 100 percent. Right. They would say, oh, this is a highly technical thing. It's you know, we don't need these people to be able to connect and have conversations across vast distances. It's it's dangerous. It's risky. Think of all those wires, this, uh, <laughs> you know, the ability to have fiber optic cable. Well, that's you know, that's going to cause damage, you know, health, lots of health risks. You know, they, mm -hmm. you could think of a myriad of objections they'd be able to throw in front of it to say, hey, we, you know, we, we can't do this. And, and maybe that's actually an argument against Satoshi being from the future, because if time travel were possible, I think that's one of the first things that would happen. Yeah. Well, I, that's my, my theory was that uh, time travel, you can't physically do it, but you can do it through code and like find a way to unravel code and have it, you know, pr make ones and zeros appear in a certain pattern that, you know, display a message. Anyways, that's going, I'm going off on a tangent there, but the, um, yeah, I, I think that they would, you know, because if I've, this is a movie idea that I'm going to um, pitch to our team, but like imagine COVID happening in like the 80s, like we would just believe like everyone would believe everything. There wouldn't be a division because we'd be like, well, yeah, I mean, the news said it. Well, you the know. essential I to an extent, but the essential issue with COVID. Right. And the reason that people, for the most part, don't have the same like visceral reaction to it as the as they did for all the disaster movies of the 80s 90s and etc is because i think pretty quickly everybody found out that who was most at risk by covid and then who wasn't and so it wasn't this situation like if you listen to the media narrative the government narrative on covid it's it's like this mystery illness that you can get without symptoms and no one is safe from it right but then you also know lots of people who have got it. And yeah, it may have sucked. I, I had it, right? I had a pretty crappy week. Like it was definitely not the flu. Wouldn't do mm -hmm. it again. But it also, you know, like I got, you know, I, I, I ate like, you know, Vietnamese soup and, uh, you know, watched a bunch of TV, you know, for a while, you know, it was, I was okay, right? And I'm, I, again, I don't have comorbidities. Uh, I exercise, I go outside a lot. You know, this is not something that really knocked me off my game for too long. That being said, if you're some, but, but we know, right? We know that if you're someone who's, if you're overweight, if you're older, or if you have any of the various um, immunodeficiencies, then you are more at risk. And yet mm -hmm. the government didn't want to discuss it the way that people could obviously see the way it was working in real time. They wanted a one size fits all answer for everything. Mm hmm. 
and that you know they want it coming from that would them. be and that would be the same regardless of what you know era it was happening in yeah yeah and um what are your uh what are your thoughts on the uh the so to pivot a little bit the to central bank digital currencies um you know, do you think that those are just going to fall apart and not really work with since we already have something like Bitcoin out there and everybody sees CBDCs are just going to be a way for them to track and eliminate your wealth? Well, I mean, how, how is that different from the way the U.S. dollar is run now? I mean, we talk about true. the printing presses, but, you know, a lot of this really, like you said, is just ones and zeros um, that, you know, the Fed has them here, you know, the uh the treasury, U.S. Treasury has them there, right? The bonds go out, et cetera, right? They're not actually printing dollars and then sharing that back and forth when they're doing all the quantitative easing, right? This is just, it's on ledgers, right? So to an extent, it is highly digitized already. I mean, pretty much the only time, I mentioned rosary earlier, um, uh, Freudian slip, but mm -hmm. you know, pretty much the only time that I even use uh, cash money is when, you know, I'll give a little bit of cash to my son, to throw in the collection plate at church on Sunday, right? I think yeah. every other time that he's seen. So I think about this now having a three-year-old, I have a nine-month-old as well. And, you know, what will he think money is? Because he's growing up in a world where it's all digital for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, to me, it's just like the dollar has been digitized already. And, you know, they talk about like wage garnishments, you know, like all that stuff is that's the stuff has existed, but now they're talking about, you know, like in Europe, you know, they have, they have negative interest rates, you know, and, and I mean, China, I think with their, di their digital yuan, they want to, um, they want to set expiration dates on it. Um, you know, so, so where do you land on that as far as understanding like what their, their goal is, you know, and what do you think, are they just looking to continue to, you know, take people's wealth out from under them without them knowing? I mean, it, it all comes down to what system is a better way to extract centralized wealth uh, from 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 people and to hold control over it, right? You know, whether you're talking about a communist system or a capitalist system, right? You know, it's mm -hmm. still all about you know where does the control lie, who controls the wealth. That's 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 the bottom line in terms of all of this. Um, and you're right that this is something that Bitcoin actually does disrupt, and. You know, I do think that's one of the reasons that there's a lot of people. I remember when Bitcoin first came out and it was like Bitcoin, that's, you know, that's international criminals and mm -hmm. the dark web, Silk Road, um, you know, assassins, drugs, pornography, etc. You know, and it's like, no, it's, it's just the digital currency. I mean, you use it for anything. Just like, you, you know, you know what else pays for, for drugs and pornography and, <laughs> and, and all that stuff? The U.S. dollar, right? <laughs> like. Obviously, Every time they talk about how that. Bitcoin is used for drugs, I just think about, you know, have they never seen in a movie where somebody has a rolled up $20 bill and they snort cocaine through it? Yeah, and or like, like <laughs> go, go show me any DEA bust when they've got the cartels and there's always a huge pile of U.S. dollars, for, you know, in a duffel bag or something, right? It's, it's kind of silly. And what, what do you think they're going to try to do, though? Because like they don't, you know, the beauty of Bitcoin is that you can travel through time and space it can travel through time and space and it can preserve your wealth and you know i, I cite this example a lot and i don't support you know any criminal but there was like i think a guy in germany that got arrested and they put him in jail and he's gonna be in there for like 10 years and they were like we have they had his wallet um but they didn't have a seed phrase and he didn't leave it anywhere it was in his head and so they were like we have your bitcoin and he was like no you don't and they were like, you're never getting this back. And basically it was like, I'm going to get out of jail and I will use the memorized words in my head to extract that money and keep it safe for myself. Um, you know, you can go across borders with that. You know, you can get on an airplane with 24 words in your head and land somewhere else and transfer your wealth with you. Um, so do you think they're going to start cracking down more? I mean, they, Gensler was just talking about it yesterday of, you know, he, he isn't aiming at Bitcoin, but he was aiming at everything else in crypto. 
Yeah, I think there is going to be, you know, a concerted effort as more and more people check out of the fiat system that they are going to make it harder. They are going to make it more painful. And, and as we've seen with COVID, you know, they, they're very effective at being able to do that. Um, it may not be the most clever. It may not be the most subtle, you know, means of, uh, of control, but they are very good at enacting control over a mass populace if they want to, right? This is, you know, the the idea of, I mean, think about it two years ago, if you had to say, to, if you thought, would you ever think to be able to say to somebody that I couldn't get on an airplane if I, if I couldn't show my, you know, vaccination status for some, uh, for a vaccine that two years ago didn't even exist, you know, you, you would have thought that was insane. Like you would have thought that was crazy. Or, but the same token, you go back to the nineties, you would never be able to say, what do you mean? I have to, I can't bring a bottle of water on a plane. It's a bottle of water. Right. And yet yeah. now we all, we all accept that as a matter of uh, it's, it's, it's almost sacred, right? It's sacred. You yeah. know, three ounces are over. You can't have it. I, you know, if I bring, you know, my poor wife, she was trying to bring the baby formula on the last time we got oh. on the flight and you know, the baby formula sparked all these, you know, we had to get the dog over and the dog had to sniff it and all this. And she's like, no, I'm going to make him a bottle like later. What's, what's the big deal. Right. And so we've accepted more and more control. And I think that also, while there is a, a yearning desire within human nature to want freedom and want um, the ability to have personal liberty. I do also think there is an equally as large um, desire for safety, for security. And so because of that, people are willing, people are very willing to say, you know what, I can deal with that. You know what, that's not so bad. This will blow over, whatever. It's just another couple of minutes, whatever. It's just mm -hmm. another line, whatever. I just have to take my shoes off. So I think you actually do have those dual sides to human nature, and it's not just one or the other. So you think, uh, I guess you view the Patriot Act as a, a gross uh, abuse of uh, government authority? Well, it's, you know, it's interesting. And I say this as a former, you know, yeah, intelligence somebody that officer, served it, yeah. that, you know, I do know times where having the ability to be able to track such things is quite useful from a national security perspective, but also you know, talking about things with dual nature, seeing the ways that it has been completely abused since the time it took place. And this is a way where, you know, <laughs> you know, you, as, as, as many things you could say, Ron Paul was right about that. Um, <laughs> you know, so you really do have to look at it as, you know, maybe there was a country, maybe there was the United States at one point that could actually handle that kind of power that actually could use that and be only willing to use that, you know, truly for actual, um, you know, you know, serious threats to, you know, crim criminals, right? You, you know, use it mm. against criminals. Um, but now you've seen a country that in a government that is more and more willing to criminalize its own citizens in order to the same way, by the way, that every country and every um you know, every empire throughout history, whenever you have a despot that takes over, the first thing they do is divide the people. They say, this is for the good of the country. This is for your safety. We have to go other after that other group of the people because they are the ones causing all the problems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, well, now I'll hit on two things here with, um, so I think these are right in your wheelhouse of uh, one is, american history and then one is uh religious so um you know i've, I've been working on this theory that i've uh, been when talking on twitter spaces with people and stuff i've said i'm starting to think that july 4th 1776 was never supposed to happen in human history because there was a nothing but authoritarian rule basically before then and um and that was the first time that the concept was tried and proven to work of freedom and individual sovereignty and i ever since 1776 the powers that be that controlled the world were have been trying to put that toothpaste back into the tube what are your thoughts on that and and you know i mean to me you know it just kind of keeps growing and growing and it whether it's america or another country freedom that genie's out of the bottle and it's not going back well, I think you have that to an extent, but you also have, you know, you have to look at back at sort of the, you know, the Greek version of uh, democracy, Athenian virtues, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, you know, Aristotle kind of 
laid this out as well that you know you can have freedoms but you also have to have duties and responsibilities and i think that's something that as americans that we do need to go back and pay attention to is to say that you know this was something that was very well understood and which is why the founding worked and it actually stuck you know you see a lot of countries certainly in many parts of the world that you know they try to get founded and they, they just blow up within the first couple of years i mean look at the french revolution for example that you know eventually led to napoleon and then led to just essentially the downfall of france as a um, as a great power and you have a situation now where there have been so many people that are they will focus on the individual side of freedom you know, my freedom to do this. I identify as that. How are you to tell me what I, what I can and can't do with my life that, you know, you sort of lose out on the, the duties and responsibilities to your country and to your community, to your family, even at the smaller level. And I think that that's one thing in the West where we start to have to, we sort of do have to kind of dial things back and start to understand that it's not just about the freedom to say whatever you want, do whatever you want, but also understanding that there will be duties and responsibilities tied to that. And, you know, if we are going to have this country going forward and if we want it to succeed, then we are all go- obviously going to have to chip into that or else it's not going to. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You know, you have to, you can't have nice things if you don't want, if you don't do anything for them, you have to, you know, I mean, that's kind of what's funny with politicians and why I'm so, like just basically not supporting any politician is that it was never supposed to be a career. It was supposed to be a duty that you stepped away from the private sector, you know, did your civic duty and then went back. And now it's, it's just become this corrupt apparatus. Um, So the other one was the uh, religion aspect, the uh, you're, so somebody asked on Twitter about, you know, your, the Christian, view of of bitcoin and i don't know if necessarily you can give that but i wanted to kind of highlight you know something i've pointed out before is that basically the only times jesus ever got pissed in the bible was whenever he was dealing with the people that controlled the money um and you know creating a marketplace in in the temple and all that kind of stuff so do you see, I mean, cause I, I, people have talked about this before and I think that there could be a touch of, there's almost like a touch of divinity with, with Bitcoin, with a, with a money that can't be manipulated, can't be cheated and can't steal. Cause when you're stealing people's wealth, you're stealing their time. And so, you know, do you see that as like having a lot of, you know, Christian and, you know, you know, Judeo Christian values and, in, in uh, preserving people's wealth and, and not, uh, you know, taking advantage of people financially. Christ talked about economics a lot. And you're, you're absolutely right that he talked about finance, right? Give to C- render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And he's referring to the fact that that Roman coins had the visage of Caesar, you know, on them. This is 2000 years ago. And yet we still do that, right? We have mm-hmm. our our great father, you know, George Washington is on American coins, et cetera, et cetera. And then our other, you know, great fathers. Um, so, you know, again, human nature doesn't change that much. Um, but he also understood, right, to your also point as well, that when you have a system uh, where interest and is, is overcharged, then it becomes userous. And that a lot of people have pointed out that that's actually what Jesus was mad about. I mean, obviously, lending money, right, is not... You know, it's not bad. It's actually quite good, right? If you have, you have money, you can you can help somebody. You see, they have a talent. You want to get in a business together. You want to invest, right? Sure, that's great. That's wonderful. But the idea of creating um, financialization of capital and then you generating interest only based on your uh, your loaning of that capital out—that's completely different. That's not a truly um, that's really, I guess you would say, Christian way of dealing with finance. And so it does also then stand to reason that, you know, if you have a way of sort of cutting that system out, overturning the money changers, as it were, 2000 years ago in Jerusalem versus today in, you know, Washington, D.C., New York City, then you'd have to say yes, that that is in line with Christianity. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think that's interesting, you know, and, and it makes me, you know, feel you look at like the idea of charging interest and all of a sudden you go, ooh, ooh, like I feel bad earning interest on anything you know, like after you see like the way Jesus. Because if you're here. charging interest on because if you're if you're giving someone a loan 
and you mm. know that that whatever the venture is or whatever the asset is, it, and you are subsidizing failure, and then you're charging that person interest, right? You are putting them in financial slavery, and you are ma- making them financial, financially enthralled to you, right? That mm. obviously is a sin, 100%, right? And this is something that Jesus understood. This is something that a lot of religions talk about, that this, this is the wages of sin, right? We talk about it in terms of wages, right? Wages of sin, that when you're pushing those types of financial systems, you are running people into financial ruin rather than teaching people that, yes, you can use debt as an instrument, but you don't want it to run your entire lifestyle on it because then you are going to be living to service your debt, not living your life for uh, for your family, for your country, for God. Yeah, it, interesting. I, I try to figure out how I could explain this without revealing too much detail. But there was my dad pointed out one time um, there was a with a film that we were working on, and um, and an investor wanted a bunch of details to prove that we were basically it, the way it was phrased was that we were capable of doing what we needed to do but uh it was basically wanted to show that we were worthy and and my dad was like and it was really interesting because this person was you know very like bible thumping you know um uh what do you call that the uh evangelical which i mean you know everybody to each their own but i'm just like that doesn't like i'm very personal about my faith and everything like that and i just kind of it's like i just i hate whenever it gets like shoved in people's faces but so you would never think and but my dad was like it's kind of interesting that they're they're turning the money into god and they want you to bow down to them like the money that they have the power that they have over me at that moment and um yeah it's interesting you know i I think about that a lot and you you bring that up you know that you're you're enslaving someone and that's something in the bitcoin world we 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 surely uh understand um well, uh, and I guess we could talk about too a little bit. Just I got a couple minutes left here, um, and then, uh, but we could talk about the. You're going to be pushing, uh, and 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 you have a new book that you just came out with, right? You, you're, you yeah, started yeah, pushing that's right, it, right? That's right. Uh, a kids, yeah, so book. it's actually a kids book. It, it is. It's a little bit, you know, kind of similar to what we're talking about in terms of because it does get into economic issues, and we actually call it. Um, there's no such thing as free ice cream. And, uh, (laughs) this is, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually written by Satoshi Nakamoto. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, uh, but under, under his pseudonym, which is actually Jack Posobiec, that's his, that's (laughs) the pseudonym of Satoshi is Jack Posobiec. And so there's no such thing as free ice cream and it's a way, and it's, it's really not like, it's not preachy. There's no pontificating, right? There's cool characters. It's all, you know, animals. The, the main character is a fox and he's, ch- he's getting chased by these wolves. And the wolf- but the wolves are constantly promising everybody free ice cream while the fox finds out what they're up to. And it turns out that he wants them, they want them all to be slaves for the wolves. Yet he's trying to run around and convince everybody, right, that, that they're lying. And, you know, the whole story is that he has having so much trouble convincing them because all of the promises of the free ice cream sound so good. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Where have I heard that before? Um, <laughs> I know, right? I mean, you can, <laughs> you can apply it to so many different things, but actually at the end of it, and it's part of this larger um, book series called Brave Books. So you go to the website, bravebooks.us, and they've got, they've got, a, they've got stuff on all sorts of topics on there as well. You know, different, um, they've got like uh, gender issues is one, they've got one on babies, you know, and so this is book three of the series. And if you, you know, for folks out there that are look like, you know, like me, I go into, a Barnes and Noble or a books to million. And I want to get some books for my kids. And I'm like, man, this is like, it's so political. Like it's, I see Obama, Clinton, uh, uh, Biden, Harris on like all the kids books. And I'm like, can I just get something that's a little more like, you know, basic common sense, traditional values kind of stuff, like not political really. And so that's what brave books is trying to do. And so there's a 12 book set that, it, you know, we're actually working with uh, homeschoolers. We're working with some, church faith-based organizations to kind of like really drive this home to say that, yeah, we have to start playing in this space because otherwise you are going to completely cede it to those that are driving into that space and are trying to politicize it. So uh, at the end of each book, there's kind of like a little, not, not, you know, not like anything super formal, but, you know, a, just a series of questions and kind of like 
discussion points that may have come up throughout the reading of the book as a way to say, hey, you know, when this character was faced with this situation, you know, did he realize that, you know, what was going on? And then it creates a discussion topic that the parent, the educator, whoever can read to the, with the kid and like start to talk about those basic life lessons. But, you know, with the idea that we're going to instill some of these basic traditional values early on and then just do so with a good story. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's awesome. And I really like that. I think, you know, I mean, the, the Paw Patrol, not, I mean, not the Paw Patrol teaches bad stuff, but I'm like, God, there's got to be stuff with like more substance for kids. You know, like we really want, we have our kids. What they well, honestly, they like, love so Mr. My, you know, my, my three-year-old, it's funny. Cause like he's, he's sort of my guinea pig for some of this stuff. And he mm -hmm. dude, loves the Paw Patrol, just loves it. But yeah. Which, and I'll give him this, like Paw Patrol does teach you the value of community, right? Because they're always yep. trying to save the, save the city. Um, you can tell I watch Working a little together. bit of it they're all, yeah. They all work together. Um, and actually, they, there's some stuff there that I wonder if kids get because they'll have like the construction dog will run out and say, oh, that looks like a, uh, the bridge is down and one of the bracing supports need, needs, a, uh, needs a new, uh, a new strut available. Can we put it at 45 degree? I'm like, I do not think my three-year-old is getting this. No, Nia, no, definitely not. They're like, although it is funny because there's one show. I don't know if your three year old seen it. I've, uh, I have a six year old and a two year old, and um, and so we're the show Blaze, the way to the monster truck. That no, no, no. well, like, I mean, I've seen monster truck, but I don't know if I've seen that one. Okay, yeah, but they'll like he'll sit there and like talk. The older one will be like, he'll be like, yeah, you know, the fulcrum, and I'm like, what? I'm like where did oh that's cool yeah where'd you get that you know um and i guess uh so we could kind of to wrap up here like announce a little bit uh movies plus my platform that uh, i've been shamelessly plugging every once in a while here on the podcast um but uh you you know we're for to give everybody an idea we're purely for free speech and that is we don't have any ideology we don't have any lean we don't have any any bent in one way or the other we are for free speech and uh that struck a chord with you so i think uh i think we're going to be doing some stuff together here is that right uh no i i think that's like we said before it's it's all about the power of distribution it's about making uh you know having content is great but you know like this book series that we're doing like that's that's amazing that's wonderful but if i didn't have the podcast network if i didn't have the blogosphere if i didn't have social media, right? How would I get it out? How would I be able to share it to anybody? So the idea that you have of taking this network and propping it up and showing people that, yes, you can have, you know, sort of another option out there other, other than like sort of, you know, the totally politicized, like, like Disney plus or, or Netflix, different things. It's actually a great way. I think it's a really smart thing to do because just dis distribution is power end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And so to give your code out there, so we were going to do, you're going to have a promo code that gets people a discount, but we haven't even settled on a code. So do you, but I have an idea as to what you probably want it to be. Oh, well, the, yeah, there's, there's only one, you know, we started with mypillow.com up to 66% off, but now folks, the power of the powerful promo code POSO, P-O-S-O, this can bring you unbelievable enjoyment goodness the fulfillment of your life when you use I'm just kidding. but no it's a uh, you know promo code poso it's like take it on a life of its own i find that people are like you know using it in um you know using it in memes and jokes and stuff themselves even when i haven't even mentioned it i'll just say something about like you know if you're looking for a good night's sleep and then people will respond they'll say promo code poso it's hilarious yeah yeah and that's what i mean i know i'll say the the um so if you go to mymoviesplus.com and you sign up so the price is 29.99 for the year or 5.99 a month but if you use his promo code poso uh the price drops to 24.99 for the year or 4.99 for a month and like really to me like the way i look at it was i was like wow like i you know i buy movies you know this is my salesman uh coming out talking about my platform but i like I buy movies all the time, you know, if it's not available anywhere and it's like, there's, there's going to be at least, you know, a handful of movies on our platform where you're like, yeah, I'd buy that. You know, we have the plot against the president and um, we have the Clarence Thomas documentary and everything like that. And a lot of stuff that was banned by other platforms, mind you. Um, and we'll also, we'll actually, we'll, we'll be having uh, your Antifa doc out there um, available. Excellent. 
Yeah, it'll be available, you know, for people you don't have to have. A yeah, that, when I, that. we did the Antifa documentary and, you know, we put it up, we got it, actually Halloween of last year is when we got it up. And even now, right, you, um, I think, what is it, uh, Vimeo took it down and they said, they, this is what, what got me, is it's a documentary about an extremist group and that commits violence. And then Vimeo took it down because they said it was violent. I'm like, I can find every action movie has violence in it, right? I'm not glorifying the violence. I'm saying we need to stop the people who are doing the violence. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, the hypocrisy. It's like, it's like oh, they, this is a movie about crime. Yes, because it's about criminals. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's just crazy. I mean, you look at one of the Saw movies. Tell me that the, those videos don't have violence in them. Come on. Give me yeah, I mean, every Star Wars is is uh, glorifying the um, uh, dismembering your opponents with energy weapons <laughs> and with laser swords, as Luke Skywalker right, yeah, I mean, in my yeah. childhood with in the Last Jedi. Um, so yeah, yeah, that, uh, we'll, we'll have that on there and we're, you know, if anyone's out there and they're like, Oh, I'm triggered by this. Cause Jack's on the right. And you guys are right wing Trump supporters, blah, 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 blah. And I always tell people I'm not a Trump supporter. I'm not, I am a nobody supporter. I am freedom of speech. And, um, and so if you are triggered by Jack being on this podcast or having his stuff on our platform, I ask you to bring the polar opposite of Jack and I will interview that person. <laughs> And I will also put their stuff up on our platform. Who would be the the polar opposite of Jack Posobiec on the left? Uh, you know, you'd have to find somebody who just, you know, maybe like Chank Weaker or something. Someone who just like totally supports the system, totally believes everything the government's putting out, totally says, go along with the government or else, you know. Uh, and I hope, I hope I'm not mis, you know, mis, yeah, uh, yeah. misstating his opinions or anything, but that's that's the type of person you would need. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, yeah. Do what to... Hollywood celebrities tell you. Exactly. Yeah. Listen to them unequivocally. They're right and do it. And I'll, uh, I will, I will have that conversation with that person and I will put their stuff up. I mean, we even put a, I put a tweet out through the Movies Plus uh, platform because people were coming after Bill Maher. And like, and that's the thing. People, if they attack and come after me and assume I'm, a, I'm supporting only right wing, it's only because the right wing is what's getting censored right now. You know, so that is why it looks like you would look at our platform and go, oh, it's like a Trump supporter. Um, we're open for everybody. And so I said to Bill Maher on Twitter, I was like, when they come for you, I'll be here. Well, they're going after, I mean, they're going after Nicki Minaj now. Nicki Minaj, I mean, I don't think anybody would call her, or, you know, um, on the right or anything like that and you know she just told a story about something that happened to you know somebody she knew and her family and now you know you've got entire mainstream media news cycles just blasting her over this and it's though to me it's kind of interesting watching it from afar because you're kind of seeing somebody get red filled in real time because you say wait oh, a minute yeah. you know all of these media outlets are misrepresenting what i said even though what i said is clearly contained within the tweet itself but they're twisting it around to make this bigger narrative that isn't what I said. And it's like, it's amazing when you're in the middle of it, you can actually see what they do. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's crazy, you know, how they, they don't have, they don't care what your ideology is. They're going to silence. It'll come for you eventually. So you have to plan accordingly. And, uh, and that's what the, the movies plus plan is. And, and, uh, and that's why Bitcoin's a happy space for me because, you know, I don't like, it, like people from all different ideologies are in one place and we believe in one thing together and that's freedom um freedom of the ability yeah, to bit, use bitcoin money is and, indie at the end of the day bitcoin is definitely not corporate but. yeah yeah definitely all right well jack i'll let you go thanks so much for coming on and uh you know and let's go throw that post at where can people use poso so they'll be able to go to mymoviesplus.com or if you go into the app stores and search movies plus you'll be able to download the app sign up use the promo code poso but where else can they use POSO to get a discount? Uh, so we have where can they follow the... you and all that kind of books? I'll yeah, put yeah, all yeah. this so stuff in the show notes. For, but... the, uh, for the book, and I, I appreciate you giving me a chance to kind of talk about the new kids' books that we're doing. Um, so if you go to bravebooks.us, you can use the promo code POSO there. Um, you've got my podcast, which is launched this week. That's actually free, so you don't have to worry about promo code POSO in there. But you know, if you want to get at me, that's a way to do it. Getter is a great new platform. A lot of people are using it. I really like it. It's smooth. They're actually constantly upgrading the thing. Um, it, it works really awesome. So Getter is a great place to follow me. And then, of course, uh, 
for the best night's sleep in the whole wide world. Once you're done listening to all of your podcasts and you think, how can I go to sleep when I've got so many of these wonderful, Corey's put so many mind worms into my brain. How can I possibly sleep with my mind spinning a million miles an hour? Well, the only way to get the best night's sleep in the whole world after listening to the podcast is going to mypillow.com and saving up to 66% off your, your purchase with, uh, with promo code POSO. And how much does that uh, crack you up to just have that, uh, to use that voice in that conversation? <laughs> be able to just throw it out there like that it's, I, the, I, honestly the way. novelty still hasn't worn off because it, the the best part of it is it's like it, you know um it, my it, we just lost uh, norm mcdonald who was my yeah. actually my favorite comedian and um you know got to meet him once years ago at a show and just just amazing guy followed his entire career but the one thing i always say about norm's comedy was that it wasn't necessarily about the setup and the punchline it was about just telling a really weird story and then throwing in something that you weren't expecting to come at the end of it right that was all of his jokes right and so uh... you know it, it that's what made it so novel was that you never knew that a that you didn't even know you were in a joke, right? You might think he's just telling a story and then something crazy happens and you don't know what's going on. And, and it's that uh, him making you uncomfortable, him using that, those emotions, voices, whatever it was that he was doing. That's, that's what I just thought was so good about him. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody I worked with or somebody I know worked with him and they said that he was like, he's on, he was on all the time. Like it, it was like, that was just how he lived his life as he was constantly doing a bit. Like his life was a bit, you know, um, so it's a, it's a shame that we lost him. But uh, well, yeah, uh, Jack, thanks so much for coming on. Um, and we'll have to we'll have to do this again sometime. Really appreciate it. Let me know what gets up off the show. Have a good one. All right. Thanks. Mm-hmm.